So I want to welcome everyone, and of course, especially Sister Jane and Brother Olaf. And today we are, they are going to share the law of the circle, why we are attached to people. So the time is yours. Please start the prayer, and we are looking forward to what you have to share with us. Wonderful. It is good to be here with you all. And let's just uh, bow in prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, we do thank you so much uh, that you are here with us. And as we discuss matters of great importance, we thank you that your spirit will lead us into all truth. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this morning we are looking at uh, the law of the circle and uh, why we are naturally attracted to certain people. Have you ever experienced where uh, you meet a stranger and uh, you have an instant re rapport uh, with that person and without even uh, understanding why? You've just met them and, uh, and you have a connection with them and it's as if you knew them for a long time, yet here you are standing in front of them, just meeting them for the first time, and it's just two or three minutes into the conversation. Yeah, and and it can it can work both with romantic attachments, and it also works with friendships. I had a friend that uh, we just connected; we hardly knew each other, but when we were out and about, everybody thought we were sisters, and and we had only met each other a short time before that. Um, there's a reason. There's a reason why we have these connections and attachments. And it's because of these connections and attachments uh, that take place, uh, we can sometimes end up in, in very difficult situations as we have relationships that are not necessarily for our good. And, uh, uh, but because we're drawn uh, with these attachments, we enter into those relationships just the same. Uh, because we we have that that instant rapport with that person or what have you. Well, from the scriptures, we find some principles uh, that the Bible teaches that we're going to find very interesting. Our first scripture is Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open your Bibles up with us. This is one of my favorite favorite stories in the Bible. Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. The context is Moses is asking God, he says, show me your glory. Uh, God he says, I want to see you. Yeah, I want And to... God wanted yes. to reveal himself to Moses. That's what really touched my heart. It... And, and we pick up uh, in verse 6 and 7 what the Lord does to show Moses his glory. And so we start with reading verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children and the third unto the third and to the fourth generation. Uh, and so here, uh, Moses wants to see his glory. And and what does God talk about? He talks about what? His character. His character. Yeah. That's, that is God's glory. That's the beautiful thing of the God we serve. We serve a God who has wonderful character. That's what really is so inspiring. And so that's the cornerstone as, as to who he is. It's, uh, it's his character, and we see uh, mercy and justice being described here in verse 6 and 7. Yeah. Now, interestingly, this description of his character we find in the second commandment that God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone, and we, we pick this up in Exodus chapter 20. So we're in our Bibles, we're going now to the book of Exodus. Uh, chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, is uh, and 6, 4, 5, and 6, Exodus 20. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And so again, here we, we see uh, God's character being demonstrated uh, in contrast to graven images. God is a God of mercy and love, and yet he's also a God of justice. Uh, that, that phrase, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, it may come across, this. there is a principle in these scriptures, and, and the key here is visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. But the second, the next verse, verse six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So what does it mean? visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children unto the third and fourth generation. Does that mean the children are guilty for the sins of the father? I would tell you, well, I don't need to tell you. The Bible will tell you. Okay. No, no, that's not true. So we go to Ezekiel. Now we're going to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. Uh, Ezekiel 18. We're going to look at verses 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And what mean ye, this is Ezekiel 18, verse 2. What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord, verse 3, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Verse 4, behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And this is the key. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So God is telling us here that though the iniquities of the Father are visited on the children, the children are not responsible. They are not guilty for their father's sins. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The choices we make the the sin in our life we are guilty for ourselves so um another verse here well the uh, what i also would like to just emphasize is what we're seeing so far is that the sins of previous generations are basically uh seen in the lives of the following generations the iniquity uh, is passed from children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And, and yet, uh, like we just read in Ezekiel, uh, the guilt is based upon everybody's choice. And yet we see the pattern of sin being passed from father to son to father to son and so forth. Uh, on down the line. And then the key there is of them that hate me. Yeah. So in these same verses, what it's telling us is it's telling us, again, let's go to um, 2 Kings 14.6. It says, but the children of the murderers he slew not according unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers. But every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Okay, so when we're looking at visiting the iniquities, as, we, as we've seen here in the scripture, it's not the guilt. It's not the, um, the they're not guilty for what their fathers have done. Visiting the iniquity means that the consequences of what the fathers have done follow the generations down from one to the next, but it's of them that hate me. So these scriptures actually give you the, um, they tell you the con what happens, the natural order of things, but they also tell you, how do you break this cycle? So the Sometimes we hear the, hear the expression, well, that's the way my father is, and so mm -hmm. that's the way I am. You know, my dad my dad had a temper, so I have a temper, you know. And 
and and uh, can't help myself. Yeah, and, but God comes comes back and says, "No, it's a choice. Uh, it, you are responsible for the choices you've made. Uh, in spite of the iniquity of your father, you still have a choice in the matter, and uh, that's that choice is what Jesus promises us as He hung on the cross. His death uh, gave us a choice, us a choice in this whole thing. So let's let's look at how this works okay in in a real life practical form um you see because satan we have an enemy we have a we have a terrible enemy he is trying to destroy us from hundreds of years before we're even born he hates the human race and he will damage our parents our grandparents our great grandparents somewhere down the line it starts and it carries on. And what we find is we find that we repeat things that generations past did. Even if we don't know what those generations did, we we will find that we repeat. And for me, I'm I was privileged to have a grandmother who shared a lot with me. And so in my life, I saw what the generations did. And I'm just going to share that with you. My story will start with my um, grandmother's mother, okay, my great-grandmother. Um, she was the first-generation Adventist. And what happened is she was married. Her husband went off to war, uh, not to war. Her husband went off to work in the mines. And uh, he was away. He was sending money back home. And he sent her one day a letter. They had seven children. And the letter said, sell the farm, and I'm going to send you money, and I want you to come and be with me. Well, that was the last communication she ever had from him. He disappeared without a trace. To this day, we have no idea. We've, we've searched for mining disasters, everything. There's no trace of this man. He was gone. Okay, well, what that did to my grandmother's generation, her and her six siblings, is they grew up without a father in the home. First generation Adventists, it was an unpopular religion. Um, they were teased and picked on in school for being Sabbatarians. Um, but they didn't have a father figure. They had a broken family. They didn't have the guidance of a male in their life. Okay, on top of that, now in that time frame, the um, you've heard of the dirty 30s, the depression hit, and the family went into poverty. The mother had to work hard to raise her family, and it wasn't that hard for uh, it wasn't that easy for women at that time to try and support a family. So the mother was overworked, very busy, was not available for her children very much, and these children kind of had to raise themselves in a sense. Okay, well, my grandmother grows up now in this environment and the war hits when she's a young woman, the World War II, and she meets a man. She doesn't know this man at all, but he convinces her that she should marry him because he's about to go off to the war and most likely he isn't going to come back. He was in the army. And so he convinced her, if you marry me, I'm probably not coming back and you'll get a widow's pension and you'll be set. Well, grandma had grown up in poverty. She had grown up without the guidance of a father. She didn't know a whole lot about men. And so she agreed to this arrangement and she married him. This is where the iniquity starts because she married a man, not because she loved him. She didn't even know him. She married him for very selfish reasons. He's going to go off to war and die. She probably was hoping he would die because she didn't intend to be his wife. And she would have financial security, which was very important to her because she had grown up in poverty. Okay, so she marries this man. But this man did not go off to war. Nobody knows in the family why he was discharged within, I think, a couple days and came back to his wife now. Now she finds herself married to a stranger. Okay. Well, she discovered very quickly this man had a terrible temper, jealous rages. He was a drinker. He he had a, a quite a drinking problem. He was a habitual liar. He he was a con man, obviously. He conned her somehow. 
So this is the character of the man she married. Naturally, she didn't end up staying married to him. She had four children and uh, it ended in divorce and he went his way. So now you have the next generation growing up just like she did in a single parent home. Again, when that was very unpopular, um, she had no father figure in her life. Uh, her mother had to work a lot and wasn't around a lot. I remember her mother working out of town and uh, their grandmother being the one who was kind of overseeing them, but uh, the kids kind of took care of themselves. So this is what my mother grew up in. And what happens now? My mother, she gets a job, she's independent, she buys a little car, and one day she's driving down Main Street and another car beside her, you know, in the 50s, 60s actually, you know how the movies show you, the car beside her starts revving its engine. She looks over, she starts revving her engine. She's driving a little mini Austin, so it's not a muscle car. And they end up in a drag race down Main Street, okay? Pull into a gas station shortly afterwards, and out of the other car comes this tall, handsome, dark uh, guy. And my mother is immediately smitten. Okay, she doesn't know this guy. <laughs> Total stranger. In fact, Nobody knows him. He's a stranger in town. He's from the East. She lives in the West. Well, long story short, very quickly, they end up engaged. And she's going to marry this man. And uh, my grandmother became suspicious and hired an investigator and discovered that this man was already married to someone back East. So she, um, my mom has a conversation with her mother on the phone and her mother says, he can't marry you. He's already married. You get your butt home. And my mother, strong willed woman that she was, she hangs up the phone. She's angry. And she looks at this man who became my father. And she says, uh, what direction is this road? And she points and he says, well, that goes home. And she goes, and what, what, or where does this road go? And she points the opposite direction. And he shrugs his shoulders and he says, well, that can go anywhere. And she says, let's go that way. That decision she made in that very moment changed my life and my siblings' lives. And some of you have heard my testimony. Um, so what happens? She runs away with this man. She goes out to the east. She ends up in a very difficult situation, very hard life she had there. And she has three children. I'm the first and two younger ones. Well, it wasn't very long after she was married to him, she discovered that this man was kind of a con man, naturally. Um, what, what else would you expect from someone who's married to one and gets engaged to another? He did divorce so that eventually they could have a legitimate marriage. But he had a very bad temper. He had um, rage and jealousy. He would throw things. He would smash things. Um, he was an alcoholic. He was a terrible alcoholic. I can remember as a little girl, him passed out on the bed or throwing up in a bucket. Um, he, he basically, he had all the character traits of her father before. But with, with this, we'll call it generational sin. With these generational sins, it, it continues and it grows. It gets bigger. So this man had all the traits of her father, plus this man sexually molested her children, which was myself and my siblings. Um, so we grew up in this environment. My father was present this time. He wasn't missing, but his presence was not, he, he was not an example of a father to us. And it created a whole host of problems in me as I grew up and things I had to deal with. Well, the next generation, so this is what I grew up in. The next generation is me. And what happened is I left home at 17. I couldn't wait to get out of that house. Uh, naturally, it was a, it was a terrible place to be. Um, this father had a temper, he was overbearing, and he was abusive. So I left at 17. I moved to the other side of the country to get as far away as I could. Uh, and what happens? I meet a man 
This man is 20 years older than me. This man had a serious drinking problem. This man was a pedophile. Um, he was convicted in, in England before he came to Canada and had done jail time, but I wasn't aware of all that. Another thing that's very, very similar is this man was married when I met him. Sounding familiar? I wasn't fully aware of my mother's story when I went and I repeated what she had done, but with it, it had more added on to it. So in the end, naturally, again, this ends up in divorce, and I have children, and my children themselves go on, and they have a whole host of challenges of their own. So you kind of can see how this um, generational sin works, how this visiting the iniquity. I wasn't responsible for the choices my mother made, but her choices affected me and affected my choices as I moved on. So when we look at this and we look at um, how we're attracted to other people, why was I attracted to someone who was just like my father and the relationship my mother had with him? Why was she drawn into a relationship that started almost exactly the way her mother's relationship started. And I'm certain she didn't know how her mother's relationship started. So these things, what happens is, you can elaborate. Well, it, it's it's the choices of previous generations. They are repeated. Your mom made choices. Yeah. And the choices she made were repeated in the choices you made without you even realizing it. And uh, unconsciously, uh, choices are made in that direction. And Oh, I, and I should point out, when it came to me, I saw the dysfunctions in our home. And in my mind, I always said, I will never live like this. So I made choices, even though I didn't like what I grew up in. And I married someone who was just like my dad, even though I consciously knew I didn't like what my dad was. And I had determined in my heart, I will never have a life like this. And yet I went and I repeated it. And unconsciously, those choices were made. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the question comes, well, why does this happen? Why does this happen? Have you heard of the term deja vu? It's a French word. Deja vu means already seen or um, seen again. It's basically the experience I've been here before. I know I have been here before. Yeah. And there's a familiarity. Uh, there's a comfortableness. It's interesting that a, a study was done on people uh, in regards to deja vu. And they took a group of people, put them in a room, uh, put some uh, objects in the room that were not very noticeable, just on the side, you know, obscure type of thing. Like a vase here yeah. or just an ob obscure object sitting in a corner. And they told the people that they were doing uh, a study on a certain thing, so their minds were somewhere else. Uh, and then they took those same people, put them in a different room, and uh, uh, but they put those objects that had been in the previous room in this different room that these people had never been in. And probably in different places. Different but, places. Yeah. And somehow when the people entered the room, there was a sense of familiarity. They couldn't identify why they felt so familiar. They felt I've like been they'd here been before. there before. Yeah. 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 And so things of familiarity bring to us in our in our psyche, in our subconsciousness, whatever you want to call it. It's like a magnet. It draws us. It, it draws us. It, it, it brings out... To, out of out of us uh, a sense of familiarity a comfortableness i've been here before yeah. and people have instant rapport with strangers something that there 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 is a familiarity with them uh, and and they're instantly comfortable and 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 like we were talking about earlier at the beginning you can meet somebody and you have no idea why there is such an instant rapport with them and it's as if you've known them all along Oh, uh, and it's it's this deja vu experience. So, yeah, see, as as humans, we are drawn to what is familiar and we are repulsed by what is unfamiliar. 
when someone is different, we're repulsed by it. Yeah, and, but but if we have a sense of familiarity, we're very comfortable, yeah. and we let our guards down. Mm -hmm. We we uh, unconsciously say it's this is a safe person, what have you, because it feels like home. It it's familiar. So then, let's say a little girl grows up in a home who has the home has a father her father is a narcissist in other words he's very selfish he's focused on himself the world revolves around himself he's angry when things don't go his way he has temper has it he has addictions his, his life is filled with addictions he's a selfish person and this little girl grows up and enters the dating scene and she finds herself attracted to the rough and tough guy because to her that's what a man is even and it's unconscious she doesn't she's not looking for someone like her father she doesn't like her father okay but what the what the um vision what the understanding of a man is is someone who's tough because that's what she grew up with that's what a man was and oftentimes when we end up in relationships at the beginning of a relationship everybody's on their best behavior so you're you're trying to impress the other person so you will talk nice to them you will be sweet to them but there is an underlying something that you cannot hide that that my subconscious will connect with in someone else i won't recognize it i don't know what's going on you know it's like oh he's so wonderful oh he's so sweet um and typically when it comes to dating situations it is recommended that if you are involved in a dating situation you do not commit to marriage for one year and the reason that is is because it takes that long for the masks to come down and the real person to to kind of step out and you to see it otherwise they always look wonderful but what you're actually attracted to is something that may not be good if you came from a home that had dysfunctions so in our in our analogy here uh so the this little girl she does come from a uh, a home where the father is this way a selfish father and uh and and there may be guys on the sidelines who who are good guys in the sense that that uh they're they kind. they're kind they're loving they're unselfish they, they take don't have other, the dysfunctions they, yeah and mm -hmm. they don't have the anger issues because they they have their they grew up in a home that didn't display that yeah so and and to such a uh, a guy this girl who grew up in this other type of home it feels repulsed by these nice guys. Mm -hmm. He's not a man. He's weak. <laughs> and this nice and the nice guy may think, well, I don't understand why this girl doesn't like me. Um, I'm, I'm uh, treating her well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and because he grew up, let's say, in a home where father was that way, he was kind and considerate to his mother, and and that was the example. That now we should also yeah. should also point out that it is unusual for a healthy person to be attracted to an unhealthy person. Yeah. Generally, when you are drawn to someone, you almost have identical backgrounds. Um, if there's been abuse in your home, even secrets in your home you will be attracted to someone who has the same abuses and the same secrets. And I found that in my relationships that uh, the people that I was attracted to had also, even if they didn't tell me, it turns out they had had sexual abuse in their past. So you, you tend to, the people that you tend to be drawn to, the people that you tend to end up married to are usually people that have had the same abuses, the same experiences in their upgrowing, in their formative years. And that what makes that's what makes you drawn to each other, the familiarity. So let's say uh, a little boy grows up in a home mm -hmm. and he grows up in a home with a mother who is manipulative. Uh, I know of someone who um, he grew up uh, in a home just like what we're describing here. And uh, at three and four years old, his mother uh, 
was very manipulative in in the sense that she would pretend to cry uh, if he wasn't doing what she wanted him to do. So she would use emotional um, manipulation, pretending to cry. Oh, you don't want it. You don't like me. You know this type of thing. And uh, uh, and as he grew older and discovered uh, that uh, that she was being that way, she would use anger. Yeah, when the and, emotional manipulation of crying didn't work, then she would use anger and fear. And and now here, years later, he is married uh, to a woman who is exactly the way his mother was. Uh, when she doesn't get her own way, goes into crying fits and and manipulates not only him yeah. but their children as well. Yeah. And 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 he he's asking us. What happened? I, that's exactly what I didn't want in my life. And I ended up with that. Yeah. You're attracted to what is familiar, not to the unfamiliar, but to what is familiar. And like Jane was saying, a healthy person will be attracted to healthy people. Uh, unhealthy people will be attracted to unhealthy persons. And so the question then comes, well, how do we break the cycle? And that's where we go back to our scripture where it says visiting the iniquity on the children of them that hate me and showing mercy unto them that love me and keep my commandments. So breaking this cycle, because it's an unconscious cycle, it's almost like it's supernatural and you need supernatural power to break it. It's so ingrained in us because of the learned behavior, the genetics that are involved as well. Uh, it's so... Uh, ingrained in us, uh, it, we cannot go by our feelings. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can, who can know it? Who can trust it? You can't trust your heart. You know, this, this uh, uh, phrase that we sometimes hear in popular media, you know, go by, do what feels good, you know, no, you can't. You do what feels good. You're going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy the lives of your children. You can't go by your feelings because your feelings, unfortunately, are messed up. Um, in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, the scripture says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. So where do we, where should our trust be? It, it needs to be outside of ourselves. It needs to be in the Lord, not in ourselves, not leaning on our own understanding. Uh, well, he makes me feel good. Or, oh, she's she really causes my heart to, to sh uh, beat when I see her. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't go by any of that if you're interested in, in making choices for relationships that are healthy for yourself. You have to trust in God. You can't go by your feelings. You can't go by... <laughs> Uh, trusting your own heart. Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, that last portion of the second commandment, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God is interested in, in Yeah. In, and even if you've already entered into this and you're in a marriage, you're in a relationship. If, I mean, if it's just a relationship, relationships can end. But if you're in a marriage... And and you are kind of going like, what happened? This isn't the person I married. There is still hope, even once you're already committed and into this. Understanding where you've come from and understanding your partner, where they've come from, and absolute total surrender to God. God can and will break that cycle. And, and it really comes down to um, the principles of heaven is unselfishness. And and that's where following your feelings, when you're following your feelings, it is selfishness because your feelings are all about you. And it's, as you said, you know, he makes me feel like I'm on top of this world. She treats me like I'm the king. Those are, that's about you. When you're living heaven's principles and you're allowing God to work in your life, you are living an unselfish life. And therefore, if you are entering into a relationship, as we said in our previous um, lecture, 
you are going to bring everything to the feet of God and the commandments of God and the the instructions of God. And you're not going to go by your feelings at all. You're going to go by your, your head. And that's the same thing when you're in a marriage. Now, what do you do? You know, you, you've entered into this. You're here. Now, what do you do? Well, you need to draw as close to the Lord as you possibly can so that you can put your selfishness aside. That's what it means when it says um, self must die. It's it's a full surrender to living unselfishly. I'm in this now. I'm going to do what I can to the best of my ability to live to bless this other person. And Scripture also says, Jesus, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Love can change a situation, but love is a principle, not an emotion. So if we look at that scripture that we're looking at, Exodus 20, verse 6. So if you haven't opened your Bible yet, we want to really focus in on this scripture. Exodus 20, verse 6. This is the last part of the, the second commandment that God wrote with his finger in it in stone he says showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments the the condition here love me and keep my commandments what is love love is a relationship isn't it it's not an intellectual assent okay i believe in god no it's entering into a relationship a love relationship with god uh how does uh, and it's entered into intelligently by choice intelligently by choice how does a child spell love you know you've heard that expression mm. t i m e that's how love is spelled for a child how is uh, love spelled in a relationship with your spouse same thing how is it with god it's t i m e spending time with god in his word in prayer uh asking him to come into your heart uh, to live in your life moment by moment, day by day. Uh, pray without ceasing is, is a literal instruction that the Word of God says. We're to continually stay in connection, in communion with God. That's a love relationship. Uh, and then it says, and keep my commandments. So the, our love relationship is defined by how the Word of God is uh, exemplified in our life the fruit of a relationship with god is the word of god is lived out uh, like first john 2 6 if anyone um if you walk with god your his word is going to be in you and you, his word is going to be lived out in your life um, so to become a healthy person you in order to attract a healthy person you want to have healthy relationships well if you want to have healthy relationships you need to become healthy yourself. You need to be that healthy woman. You need to be that healthy man. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, well, what exactly is a healthy man, a healthy woman in a nutshell? How can we say that in a... In a well, a healthy uh, woman, the Bible describes to us, and that is the Proverbs 31 woman. And the Proverbs 31 woman is... It's not just because I've seen people go, I'm going to be a Proverbs 31 woman. So I have to get up before sunrise and make dinner for my family. And I have to do this. I have to sew. I have to. That's not what the Proverbs 31 woman is about. What the scripture is showing us in Proverbs 31 is it's showing us a character. Okay. It's showing us a character in the deeds. And the Proverbs 31 woman, she's not thinking of herself. She's thinking of those around her, her husband, her family. She's she's mature. She's not childish. She's not petulant. Um, she doesn't manipulate. Her, her whole thought and goal is for others. It's that unselfish love, that self-sacrificing love. And also just want to put a little caveat in here. That does not mean a woman who's in a relationship with an abusive man a lot just lets him continue with abuse because that's sacrificing herself. I once thought I was sacrificing myself for my children by staying in an abusive marriage and I did terrible damage to my children. So there is responsibility. And, and as we mentioned before, um, sorry, I got distracted by the comment. Um, but as we mentioned before, love is not 
being a doormat. Sometimes love is holding the other person accountable for their actions and setting boundaries. Um, but with the Proverbs 31 woman, the, the key behind this is unselfishness. You're not, everything you do is not in your best interest. It's in the best interest of the other person. Could, could you, we perhaps even say that um, abuse for a person who really cares about their partner and their partner is abusive to them, uh, if you really care about them, you will hold them accountable because you're mm -hmm. interested in helping them become a healthy person. Uh, and so abuse isn't tolerated in a healthy relationship, in, in a healthy person. Uh, it, accountability accountability is there. It's It's easier to put up with abuse from a selfish standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't want to deal with all that it takes to confront this individual or his it's or her It's easier behavior. to just let yeah. it go. And that's selfishness. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking of the other person. You are thinking of yourself when you uh, want to let things go uh, that are abusive, uh, whether abusive toward you or toward your children, what have you. Yeah. Uh, so healthiness uh, does uh, healthy love is is tough love as, it's tough love it's we, boundaries it's boundaries yeah and i think we have another lecture on boundaries as well so what about a man um what is a healthy man well i think the best example of a healthy man the best gentleman that ever walked the face of this earth was jesus himself and the scripture says husbands love your wives even as christ loved the church uh jesus is the demonstration he is the example uh, of what a real man is, someone who is kind, considerate of others, uh, who is willing to stand up against those who seek to abuse others. Uh, he has backbone, he stands for principle, and yet at the same time, he is ready to sacrifice himself in favor of uh, helping the other person and uh, blessing the other person. To live by principle, to live to bless others and not to be swayed by popularity or feelings. So how do you attain that? It comes back to what we were reading in Exodus chapter 20, verse six, that love relationship with God uh, that brings about the word of God being lived out in your life. Uh, the fruit of a love relationship with, uh, with God is, is the word of God is lived out. God is holy. God is unselfish. God is loving. When God dwells within you, and his promise in John 14, 23 is that he wants to do that. The Father and the Son want to come and make their abode with you. Uh, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When God is dwelling within you, his character, his character of love and kindness and, and uh, duty to principle as, as the needle to the pole, uh, will be exemplified in your life uh, because God is there and that's who God is and he is now living his life in you. That's how we experience the change. That's how we become healthy, by staying connected with him. Yeah, and um, when, when we, as I said before, like the Proverbs 31 woman, we cannot be focused in on tasks. I have to do this. I can't do this. I should do this. That's Phariseeism. We can't be focused on that. We need to be focused in on, on God. We need to spend time with him. We need to be in communion with him. We need to listen for that still small voice. And when we hear that voice, we need to respond to it. When you respond to that impression that comes from God, the still small voice, every time you respond, you become stronger and God will give you more. But if you don't respond, and, and sometimes it can be, you know, for me, I, I had an experience, actually, I'll share, where I wanted God to speak to me. I read a, I read a testimony of someone and the Lord had, uh, had been basically impressing him, say this, don't say that. Do this. Don't do that. And the results from following that, that impression he had were phenomenal. Well, I heard that story and I was so impressed with it. And I thought, 
I want God to talk to me that way. Don't you want God to talk to you that way? And so I started praying, Lord, I want you to direct me. I want you to tell me when to speak, when to not. I want you to show me how to reach the hearts of others. And so I started delving into my Bible and I started praying this prayer. And as I'm praying this prayer, see, I, sh I have to backtrack a little bit. I'm a person who loves to sew. I absolutely love sewing. And I love to sew vintage dresses, you know, the 50s and 60s, nip waist, big skirts. And I sewed so many dresses. I think in one week I sewed five dresses one time. So as I'm sitting here and I'm digging into my Bible and I'm praying and I'm asking God to speak to me, flashes in my mind a picture of these vintage patterns. And I thought, what was that? Push it away. Okay. And I'm praying and I'm studying and I get the impression, get rid of those patterns. And I'm going, what? Get rid of the patterns? I just bought 10 more. They're valuable. They're they're classics. Well, what I didn't realize is I had an idol in my life and God was showing me. Um, with those patterns, I had I had recently ordered 10 more of them. They were beautiful. And I had taken all my patterns, I had put them in, in a box in my living room because I would come and I would take them out and I would look at them and I dream of the dresses I'm going to make with them. I had fabric set aside and I had patterns tucked inside fabric. I was I had something like 36 patterns I hadn't made yet and I was going to make every one of them. Well, God impressed me, get rid of them. You have an idol in your life. And I didn't know I had an idol. I mean, what's wrong with sewing? What's wrong with, you know, it's it's when it becomes an overpowering focus and obsession. So what happened is God impressed me with this. And I thought, ah, I can't do that. And then I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do with them? And the impression came, burn them. And I'm like, I can't burn them. These, these are valuable classics. There's no way I can burn them. Okay, Lord, I'll sell them. I'll, I'll get rid of them, but I'll sell them. And, and I'll just shorten this story. I went through a struggle. I listed them on eBay. I went through a struggle for a week. This one's not really one of those. I can keep this one. No, I better send it. And I struggled and I fought. By the time the end of the week came, the auction was done and I had to package them up and send them. I didn't realize how attached I was to these things. I felt literally sick going to the post office to mail them. It was that hard. And I realized when it was all done, if I had listened in the first place and thrown them all in the fire, it would have saved me a lot of a lot of heartache and hurt. Well, anyway, after I had taken care of that, the next morning I'm having worship and I'm praying and I'm going, Lord, I want you to speak to me. I want you to show me, you know, how to be, give me the words, direct my paths. And the voice came to me and it said, if you don't obey what I ask you, how can I give you more? And I was shocked. And I thought, but, but I got rid of the patterns. I don't have it. And then what came to my mind is I hadn't gotten rid of them. I kept uh, some skirts because I thought they were skirts, not dresses. And he said dresses. You know how we do that? We justify and, and we go, well, God, the Bible says this, but it doesn't really cover that. And, and the Lord impressed me that if you don't live up to the light you have, he cannot give you more light. If you know there's something in your life that is causing a separation and your conscience, see, sometimes we don't hear an audible voice. Sometimes we don't have that heavy impression. Sometimes it's just this little niggly something is there and we push it aside. But if we don't live up to everything that we know is right, the Lord cannot give us more. And it keeps us bound in these generational sins. And it ties us. So when you are coming into a relationship with God, when you want to make change in your life, when you seek him and you seek to, to do his will, pay attention to the very little things that, that will come to your mind, that will cross your path. Pay attention to it. Don't push it aside. And sometimes the things we're asked to do, sometimes what God requires of us, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And when he requires something of us, sometimes it's very painful 
to give it up. And in our mind, we can justify it. What's wrong with patterns? You know, it's it's good to be crafty and God God is a creator and he made us to enjoy creation. We can justify things, but the Lord knows our heart better than we know ourselves. And so I really, really urge every one of you to examine yourself in prayer and don't let even the smallest thing slip. And as you as you turn and you follow exactly what where God is leading you, he will open up a world to you that you never imagined could be. And you heard our testimony last, last time we were on. And for me, in my bad relationships, I finally got to the point where I surrendered it all to God. And, and God brought Olaf into my life. Olaf and I have talked about, you know, we have a wonderful life together. Olaf has been God's greatest gift to me and in my understanding. But we've talked about our life in the past and we've and I'm sure if you're any of you are in second marriages that are that are wonderful, you go back and you go, why couldn't I have met this person sooner? You know, oh, if Olaf had been the father of my children, my children wouldn't be the way they are today. They wouldn't have the pain they have. And we've talked about that and we've examined our lives. And we both came to realize that God could not bring us together back then because we were not the people we were to, we are today. I would never have been attracted to him and he would have been repulsed by me. So what God brings together when we surrender and we allow him to change us is marvelous. Amen. And that's how we break the cycle. Amen. So just to recap what we've discussed uh, this morning is uh, the law of the circle is the, uh, the generational sins that are passed from one generation to the next unconsciously without even realizing it. It's learned behavior. Uh, it's genetic. It's, it's what we have experienced in our childhood is familiar to us. And so automatically we are drawn to that which is familiar. And so we're drawn to other individuals who have similar backgrounds and uh, we meet them. We have instant rapport because they have gone through the same experience that we have gone and and somehow it's home it's home for for you it's home for them and there's a, a connection taking place but uh as we had discussed that connection can actually be unhealthy because both parties are unhealthy mm -hmm. and uh both are are uh products of selfish homes what have you and and so the cycle continues and now it's passed on to the children that come now and the, and it's passed on from one generation to the next but god is merciful to those as we've read that love him and keep his commandments those who are open to receiving him into into their life god comes in and he stops and breaks the cycle in your life in my life mm -hmm. hallelujah thank you jesus mm -hmm. that he does that and as we surrender our wills to him, as we choose him, as we spend time with him and enter into a love relationship with him first, he is number one. And as he changes us, he is then able to bring persons who are making the same decision for him in their life. And, uh, when, and what God hath joined uh, truly is a blessing. Uh, and the two persons, though though they be not completely healthy as they come together, but they're committed in a relationship with God. And because of that commitment, there is a growth that takes place when two people who are choosing God in their life come together and God is able to work through the marriage and through their lives, healing and healthiness and the, the damage of broken homes and childhoods uh, it, it finds healing in that relationship yeah. that God offers. So that concludes our, our lecture time. And I just want to open it up for anyone who may have comments or questions, or I give it back to you, Eva, if you want. Yeah, to thank you so much for another powerful. I'm, I'm so glad that you are sharing experiences and what the Bible is saying, what the Spirit of Prophecy is saying. And I have this thought uh, question. You know, today it seems like many Adventists, because they don't 
they don't have any Adventist partner, you know, someone they could uh, think about marrying in the closer uh, uh, area. And then they go on, for instance, Adventist match or one of these uh, internet sites. So what are you thinking about that when one person is laying in Germany and one person in Norway or, you know, anyway, they're living far away from each other. What's the danger? Was that wise in those situations? It's actually a very good situation, believe it or not, because I, we met on an Adventist dating site. And the advantage of an adv Adventist dating site is, first of all, you can shop the person, okay? And what that means is basically there's information on the profiles that give you clues as to who this person is, as long as they've been honest with their profile. It gives you a clue as to who the person is before you actually talk to them. So you can decide whether you want to talk to them or not. And I can say for myself, I was looking for someone who was dedicated to God first. Okay. And, and I'll also mention, because you know my testimony, um, when we met on the dating site, this was a long time previous before we actually got together. It was the Lord that brought us together through circumstances later. We didn't um, get together from the dating site. But um, the, um, okay, so when you're shopping a person, for me, what I found is um, some of the questions that they had people fill out were, um, what was the last book you read? Well, if I was looking at a profile and the last book they read was a uh, um, fiction novel, I would think, hmm, this is probably not the person for me. Um, it asks, what movies do you prefer? Well, if the movies say romance and um, horror or, you know what I mean? Then I would go, this person is not for me. What music do they like? That sort of thing. So you yeah. get a little bit of a view of who the person is before you even talk to them. And you can eliminate a lot of stuff. Those are things that you often don't know about a person when you meet them face to face. When you meet them face to face, there's that familiarity we were talking about. And there's that instant attraction. And so what will happen is sometimes little red flags will pop up like, huh, oh, he he likes to you know, watch these movies that uh, are not something that a Christian would be doing, but you're so attracted to them, you go, well, maybe that can change, or maybe he's not as into it as that, you know, so, so you turn a blind eye to things you shouldn't. So when you're doing online, you can shop the person. And then once you start communicating, again, the communication is all up here. You don't have other than a picture that might be, wow, she's beautiful or he's, but the communication doesn't have all those other elements in it. It's more um, objective and, and it allows you to actually make intelligent choices. When you're in a relationship face to face and it goes bad or the, the red flags are popping up, it's much more difficult to extract yourself from it. If you're in an online situation where you're just talking with somebody and you start to see problems, it's much easier to say, okay, I'm not going to do this and extract yourself from it. So there is a whole element there that allows you to separate the feelings from the intelligent thought. Now there's problems too, because there's also a person can hide more. So again, the principle of you wait a year um, to really get to know a person, and you do have times where you get together in person and meet. But I really, I recommend it because I really believe it allows you to intelligently decide on a relationship rather than having your emotions drive the train. Yeah, I would simply add uh, Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Uh, so even in online dating, uh, you, you want to bathe it in prayer, you want mm -hmm. to ask God to guide you that you're not going by your feelings, you want to be going by God's will uh, and ask God step by step, closed doors that I shouldn't be opening, you know, having those type of prayers, ask, giving him permission to work actively in your life. 
so it's uh, like Jane was saying, certainly uh, online dating has its advantages. It doesn't negate the importance of meeting the person and spending time with the person mm -hmm. in group settings uh, with the person so you can really get to know them uh, interactively yeah. in a live way. Uh, but uh, but initially, uh, making that contact can be a very positive thing mm -hmm. through online. Yeah. Yeah. In the in the old days, and I'm going back to Olaf's mom and dad, um, they met in a, a German church in uh, Eastern USA. And back in those days, it wasn't typical to do dating like we do today, where you start holding hands and, you know, all this. With them, they just saw each other. They may have talked to each other very um, superficially. And then... Uh, one day he asks her, um, I think he asked her if if she was single, um, basically intimating he was looking for a wife. And at that time, she wasn't ready for that. And she said no. So he moved to California and she stayed in the East. And I don't know how much longer afterwards, he sent her a letter and told her he was very interested in her and he would like to marry her. And at that point, she accepted and she ended up moving out there. They got married. So the way marriages well, were done, but in the. Yeah, I would just simply add uh, part of the story is that the parents were involved. Uh, yeah. The, the mother and fathers were talking with each other. So there was a lot of family involvement uh, as well. Um, so. But it, it was done intelligently. Yeah. It wasn't with all the touchy feely, all that stuff. They, they, I mean, he looked at her and yeah, she was beautiful, but he saw character traits in her that would make a good yeah. wife. And she saw character traits in him that, yes, he's a provider. He's he would make a good husband. So they decided intelligently. And that seems to be um, for the most part back back then how how relationships were conducted, except in my crazy family. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for sharing. You know, uh, I was reminding you about when I was in self-supporting, there was this girl, this sister, she was going to Country Life restaurant in New York. And then there, there was this guy who put her eyes on her. And then he contacted first the leader of the self-supporting place and asked about her. And then he called her father if it was okay to ask for her hand. And she was the last one who was actually talked to. So what do you think about that? I think that is somehow in accordance to the spirit of prophecy. I have Amen. never read it myself, but is that right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The red flags are when the parties involved don't want to talk to the parents. Yes. Uh, don't want to involve the church community. Want to be secretive. Uh, all of that is red flags, and you want to run away from that, those type of uh, mm -hmm. beginnings. Uh, you you want you know transparency is healthy. Uh, secretiveness is unhealthiness, mm -hmm. and so yeah, definitely. And I have to say, they have been happily married, <laughs> you know. Yes. The marriage. And I wonder if any of you have heard Barbara O'Neill's testimony of how she and her husband got married. It, it's an incredible story because he, he invited her out for dinner, I believe it was once. He had never shown any interest in her before, but he had been observing her. He knew things about her, and he sat down to dinner with her and said, I think you would make a good wife for me and I think I could be a good husband for you. And that was it. And and they ended up getting married. But it was all intelligent. It was based on intelligence, not the mushy, mushy, um, swept away feelings. And that's not to deny that uh, having yes. feelings is important. You, you, uh, you don't want to be entering into a relationship where there are no feelings. So. Yeah. So you, you do. And Spirit of Prophecy <laughs> says that, too. Of course, you need to love the person. Yeah. But you need to let the. Um, this is not a business contract. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you need to let the intelligent. Well, God has set out um, what we should be looking for in a spouse. Um, 
for a lady, if you're if you meet a man and he has is not able to keep a job, um, well, you have to wonder why. Is it because his boss is so mean to him? And and you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. you see principles and you see guidelines that make a stable, solid person. And and yeah. There is a um the story of Samson. Um yeah. he longed for a Philistine to marry. And the, we all know the story. Uh, his parents say, can't you find someone in the church? And uh, he, his response well, was, well, she pleases she, me well. She pleases me well. We can't go by our feelings. We have to go by uh, the God in our life. And uh, and the community that we are part of, our family, our immediate mm -hmm. family, our church family, um, as was mentioned earlier, transparency is very important. Mm -hmm. And the people yeah. around us will recognize the red flags much quicker and much clearer than we will. And so if you're, for young people, if you're in a relationship and your parents are not involved, you are losing something that is very, very valuable because your parents love you. They will see things that you will either ignore or completely miss. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Sister Regina, good to see you with, see you with us again. Please um, comment your questions or, or uh, comments. You have to unmute yourself, please. Regina? Okay, meanwhile, we wait for Regina, maybe Suan, maybe you can come with your question or um, comment, please. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to add to what um, Jane had said about um, Barb O'Neill's story, because I did hear her story years ago. And what stood out to me uh, in that moment that Jane was talking about was um, that um, there were feelings involved, but um, Barb shared, if I could remember correctly, that within 24 hours or 36 hours, I don't know, it was a short time after he had proposed to her, the feelings came and she did love him. Yes. But what I took from that and what I think she even stated was that she did not like premeditate a yearning for him. She did not entertain those thoughts towards men she's kept her mind and, and the scripture that comes to mind is delight yourself in the lord he will give you the desires of your heart a lot of women myself included in the past looked at that and thought well i love god and so if i just stay with god then he'll give me the desire of my heart which is a husband well that's the wrong way to interpret that scripture I found if you delight yourself in the Lord he's going to give you himself because that's going to be your desire once you really enter into delighting into the Lord the desire of your heart changes and you're more looking at him and not all of the uh kind of like the extra things that you would like to have in your life whether it be a relationship or a good job or a house or whatever. And um, so I just really wanted to bring that point out about Barb's story was how she was focused on her family being her children. She had, I think, six or eight. And, um, and all the things that she did with God. And then when this man came to her and mm -hmm. said, I would like to marry you. I think she said that it um, surprised her. Um, she was a little bit stunned by his matter-of-factness. She went home, 
they got the approval of all the children. The, the children were like, wow, we've seen it for a long time. You guys are a great match. And then she probably prayed about it. But the thing that, that impressed me was that uh, the feelings did come within a very short time and, mm -hmm. and that they do share great love for one another. That's what I wanted to share. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that, I didn't know that love story. You know, I heard some of it, but not all of it. So thank you for sharing. So I don't know, Regina, are you ready? Or uh, maybe we should uh, ask Arunet. Is it you? I think it's you, Arunet, Sister Arunet. My neighbor right now, I'm in Germany and you're in Germany, Arunet. So <laughs> yes, it's me. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm quite a new Adventist. Um, yeah, so I had certain ideas about Christians or Adventists or what it's like to be one or maybe to be in a marriage as an Adventist or something. But now I see some marriages around me of Adventists and it seems like God have has put the the husband and wife together like in a very intricate way uh, they came together and it seemed all to be led by god but then uh, at a certain point years later you see that oh these people even though they were put together by god they are having a very difficult time together or something it's oh yeah so I wonder, like, so it, it almost got me a bit scared, like, oh, okay. I thought, okay, maybe once when I get married one day, you're both Christians, you're both God is first in your life. So hopefully then it might go better than when you have like a non-Christian marriage. But then I see some marriages and I'm like, well... No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So how, how does that work? Well, not everybody who claims a Christian marriage actually is a Christian marriage. And we we can't look into other people's lives. We can only know what's going on in ours. And I can share a story with you of um, a couple that appeared to be very godly. They were in my hometown and they were engaged to get married. They claimed God brought them together. They had wonderful stories of how it all worked. And uh, this girl, she, everything about her, I made a list and I prayed to God and he gave me what I want and uh, that sort of thing. Well, one of the things that they um, professed is they said, uh, now we understand as Christians, I hope we understand that intimacy is for marriage. And when you engage in intimacy without the commitment of marriage, it actually damages a relationship. And, and it, it causes all kinds of problems later. Well, this couple claimed that uh, their first kiss was at the altar. Now, when you say that, the impression that's given to us is that they were so chaste that they didn't even kiss before they got married. And I remember being at that wedding and having the pastor, when he said, now you may kiss your bride, he announced to the congregation, this is their first kiss. And everybody was like, oh, they did it all right. This is so sweet. Well, there was another young lady at the same time who was contemplating marriage. And she got into a marriage that was not a good match. She looked at this couple and she thought, they did everything right. Well, what happened is this couple that got married, it was a terrible marriage. Um, the woman was manipulative. She was emotionally um, held him sabotage. She was very self-seeking. He was very passive. He was easily uh, manipulated. They, he, She bankrupted him and claimed God gave them a house. There were so many things that were wrong in the relationship and it ended in divorce. Now, this other lady that uh, was at the same time, she ended up getting married to someone who wasn't really suitable. She saw that couple as having done everything right. And I remember her saying to me, she says, they did everything right. 
and it didn't work. She says, what hope is there for any of us? It was so discouraging for her. Well, what we discovered later is that was their first kiss at the altar, but that was the only thing that was the first at the altar. They had been engaging before they were married in everything but a kiss. So they misled everyone to think that they God was in this, God had led them, they did everything according to the will of God, and then when their marriage failed, it caused a lot of discouragement to other people who didn't do things right. Then they're going, well, see, you do it right, it, it doesn't work, and you don't do it right, it doesn't work. So that's what I would suggest when you see relationships that that don't work, there's usually more behind it than, than on the surface. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that everything we profess God did, that God did. Does that make sense? I, w- I would simply add that uh, when you enter into a healthy marriage relationship, that doesn't mean that you will never have any disagreements. Yeah. You take two people, put them together, uh, and if they're healthy, they will each have their own opinion. Um, and if they're selfish, uh, if selfishness is still something they're dealing with, then those opinions can try to uh, trump the other person. Yeah. Uh, but the beautiful thing, when God is in the mix, when both parties uh, are having a relationship with God, uh, the Lord speaks to, to each person's heart and calls them to humble themselves before the other and to uh, love the uh, love the other and so um, the uh, the idea that it well if I if I have a perfect marriage that is I marry a godly man and he is uh, living for God and I'm choosing to live for God then we should have no disagreements yeah. uh, that that is not a good or correct perception because uh, we're dealing with selfish humanity yeah we're we're dealing with individuals including ourselves mm-hmm. that we're still growing yeah. but the beautiful thing about it is we're learning how to how to uh, navigate through each other's selfishness and that selfishness is fading away um, uh, like a candle like the wax in a candle just burns away when the, the love of God is in the is in the midst of of the life, um, and uh, as you know, there are two relationship experiences that help help you grow in your walk with God quicker than anything else. It's marriage and children, yes, <laughs> and uh, they will help you recognize where your selfishness is and where you need to surrender that aspect of your life that you were blinded to uh where you need to surrender that to god so that god can transform that part of your life too and uh and that's what makes a beautiful uh marriage uh is when both parties are committed to a relationship with jesus and uh and and forgiveness and mercy is given to each other and and uh, we grow through the differences uh and in in spite of the differences, we are strengthened in our commitment to each other. I know for my wife and I, I, I can truly say I'm more in love with her today than I was even on the wedding day. And uh, uh, Amen. the honeymoon that started back then has 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 yet to end. <laughs> uh, so it, it but it was not always perfect because we were both imperfect people yes. and we had our and strong-willed people yeah we're both very strong-willed <laughs> and we had our struggles and we had our challenges but for me I married a man that when there's a conflict he is willing to humble himself and when I'm not willing to humble myself he was and he humbled me by his actions. And that's because he would always go to God first. Um, I, I've told people, I said, there's no other person in this world who could put up with me like he does. <laughs> but it's it's a walk with God. And same thing, I've had situations where there's something going on with Olaf that 
I was really concerned about and had a problem with, but I couldn't approach him because, ooh, that's going to hit a button and things are going to uh, fly or I'm going to hurt his feelings. And so because I have a relationship with God, I take it to my father in heaven and I, I tell him the burden of my heart. And I have seen over and over when I do that and I don't take it into my own hands, the problem rectifies itself. And, and it's it's beautiful thing to see. And how many years have you been married now? Ten. Ten. Okay, good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, uh, Ava, I have my uh, microphone working now. Okay, sounds good. I, I'm sorry. I'm not used to doing this. So it took me a while to figure out because every time I pushed on the microphone, it wasn't working. But my phone led me to another way to have a voice. So... Um, I had to drive down the hill from where I live because I have very bad reception. And so I'm in my car. And uh, I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for what Olaf and Jane are providing for uh, Christians around the world. Um, they came to Orosi, uh, where I currently go to church, and they offered such wonderful counsel and we have such a struggle at church where our church has had a split and most of you probably already know that and these same principles that are you are talking about in um, personal relationships and marriages also apply with um, churches and our families at church. Mm -hmm. And we need this council so desperately in our church. On um, both sides of the split, we lack the mind of Christ. There is selfishness on both sides of our split. And it's so tragic. And I would just love for both sides to be counseled with this wise counsel of how do we step out of selfishness? How do we recognize selfishness? And how do we um, seek to discipline, self-discipline our selfishness? Because I know that if we start there, that will bring the healing process to the split in our church. Because we will start to earnestly pray to have compassion for people who see us as the enemy. And I just see that we need this so much here in Arosi. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Amen. We we are praying for the situation there in Orosi, and we know God is uh, going to triumph. We're claiming that uh, that His promises are true, and they will uh, that He will bring about His purpose there for the church there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank and you then, so much. Thank you, Regina, for your uh, comment, questions, and just being with us today. It's nice to see you again. So I think it was you first, uh, Suan, was it? Yes, and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I wanted to, and this might even segue with what we just discussed. I wanted to bring up the interview that Olaf and Jane did uh, when they told their story about um, the Trinity and how they grew into that understanding. Because in my experience of watching that, and I watched it twice, because it was significant for me in several different levels, but there was like a, there's an understory going on in that interview that might be of interest to this gentleman um, and anybody else uh, that's dealing with relationship growth in your own heart and life. And that was in the way that uh, that Olaf responded to his wife's resistance to his 
um, process. And uh, I'll just give an example. The night that um, they drove home and she repeated, and, and I just love you so much, Jane, for your openness, your raw honesty in that interview, because uh, I saw elements of myself and my own relationship and where it segued different and where it was the same. But um, the way that your husband responded to your comments of why, how could you do that? Because I think you repeated that in that drive home. And then when he mentioned his son and how his son had his back and I thought, see, I kept seeing these things, these statements from your husband in the interview, how from the very beginning all the way through to the end of it, he never said anything negative about you. He always brought out his compassion towards you. And that night when he lay in his bed, and he thought about how he had spoken up in this meeting and things went bad and his wife had these feelings. His heart, you could hear it in his answers, that his heart was for, I didn't want to hurt her. And he's in this dilemma of I'm pleasing God, I'm doing what God wants me to do. But in the process, my wife is dealing with her issues around it. And I was just so impressed because I thought this is a man who's he's been rejected, too, from his first wife. And now he's going through this experience. And how's he going to deal with her? And uh, he dealt with you in my view of what I saw was he dealt with you in the compassion of Jesus and the leadership of a true godly man. And so you're the fact that now I'm hearing that you've sort of got a ministry helping people with relationships. It just is beautiful. And I think that in coming uh, presentations, I'm going to be listening up anyway, because I do think that um, the men, not to say women don't, but the men are the leader in the family and the way your mm -hmm. husband led you through your emotions during that time was a beautiful thing to behold just in that interview. So anybody who's thinking about relationships, just that interview alone, you're going to get the, the, the reason for it was about the Trinity. But underneath that, you can see the elements of a love relationship and a maturing in Christ going on. And I just respect both of you so much for your story and for your openness with people. And now to know that you do minister to couples, that, that's just thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I should add that uh, Olaf's compassion for me. See, when I was telling him, how could you do that? Who was I thinking about? I was selfish. I was thinking about myself. I was thinking about everything I was going to lose. And when he had compassion on me, it caused me to come out of myself and realize the pain he was going through too. Yes, and yes. it humbled me. And as you said, men have a very special role in a relationship. God created men as initiators and women as responders. So men, when you take the initiative, you will help your woman to respond. But you have to, it all has to come down to unselfish love. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Regina, please. Sue Ann brought out such a beautiful recommendation. I agree, Sue Ann. That interview, uh, through um, Michael McCaffrey's uh, channel is spectacular. And I, I recommend that the man that's having struggles uh, watch that interview. She's absolutely right, Sue Ann. You're absolutely right. That interview provides so much um, counsel in it. Um, 
I, I wanted to uh, also mention that Christ first loved us. Mm -hmm. That's how we are able to love Christ. Mm -hmm. That Bible verse that shows us that is such a powerful thing for correcting so many things, relationships in our life. Because if we are earnestly seeking through the compassion of Christ, we don't have it in ourselves. We need to be seeking the compassion of Christ for other people. When we operate that way, it is such a healing experience. And um, Olaf and Jane, I just really appreciate what you're doing. One other thing I wanted to quickly mention is... Um, as a young parent, I realized I didn't have effective problem solving skills and communication skills. So I sought for the help of a Methodist minister and his wife to counsel with me. And they taught me amazing things as a young parent. They taught me to give people the permission to feel what they're feeling and all the emotions that they're having, give them permission to express all the ugliness they're feeling. Say, you can hang on to this as long as you need to. I did that with my youngest son, or my oldest son, I should say. And um, he would do this thing where he would just scream for getting his way. And when she taught me that skill to look at him in his eyes and have compassion for something bottled up in him, to just give him permission, you can hang on to this as long as you need to, and you can scream as loud and as long as you need to, it cured him of that need to be heard. And uh, the counselor said, I've never heard this happen the first time. Usually it's a process where it takes place over uh, many weeks. But she said, that's amazing. And it cured him of that behavior where he would just scream for everything he wanted. So thank you so much, Olaf and Jane, for what you're doing. I just praise God that you are helping so many of us learn many new skills in communicating. Amen. Thank you, Regina. Amen to what you're saying. Okay, last comment, Lonnie and Abigail. Yes, I really appreciate what's being shared. And we um, we definitely need to, as believers in the Father and Son, you know, we don't like to necessarily call ourselves non-Trinitarian, just believers in what the Bible teaches, the Father and the Son, we need to have a lot of compassion on people that still believe in the Trinity because I, we do, because I know when I first heard this truth, I, I was very offended by it and it made me angry. <laughs> and uh, we just need to realize that that's so glued in a lot of Christians brain that God is a three in one, that he's a triad, that, you know, he's three, you know, we just, it's so glued in our head. We just can't believe that's not true. When we first heard, like I said, when I first heard it, I had angry. So yes, let's extend a lot of compassion and love. Cause I've heard some interactions with people, non-Trinitarians with people that still believe in the Trinity and they haven't been the best. <laughs> and that's not, we don't want to do that because that's not going to bring them into the truth of the Bible. You know, like you said, that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Ronnie and Abigail. Do You're you have welcome. any comments, uh, Jane or Olaf? Yeah, I was just going to say that what she's pointing out is a real key to every relationship. You see, the way God deals with us is he gives us total freedom to be who we want to be, to choose what we want to choose. He doesn't zap us when we do something wrong. He's long-suffering and he tries to draw us back. 
And it's sometimes hard as humans to give that same freedom to others and still love them. Remember with the law of attraction, we are repulsed by what is different from us. We want that familiarity. And sometimes we overstep and we try to control our spouses or other people around us, try to force them to be what we think they should be. And it creates more problems. It is only by the grace of God that we have his character so that we can allow people the freedom Amen. to think and choose as they will. And again, we get our fulfillment from God in heaven when our spouse isn't providing for what we need or being what we need them to be. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we all have got much to, you know, digest. <laughs> so maybe you would close, like to close to the prayer, Sister Jane. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for who you are and the example, Jesus, that you set for us. I pray for each one of us here today that we will allow you to come fully into our life, that you will change us, that you will make us into those loving people that you desire us to be, that you are able to make us. Thank you, Father, for the time we have shared together here. Thank you so much, Father, for all you do for us. Be between everyone here until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.